So, uh, the book. With the, the work did in the past years before the thesis, I have then continued with the reconstruction and the experimentation of neurology borders. The result was a book called Guerrillas, that mean, uh, simply means borders in Sardinian language. The book is a further step, as in the thesis, the space for doing such work of analysis of every single weapon and armor representing the statues was impossible. Each chapter is a the depiction of a single piece of equipment, armor or weapon, observed in the iconography or in the archaeological remains. The previous hypothesis made in the past by other authors as the existence of the throwing sticks or boomerangs and wire clubs were analyzed and experimentally evaluated. For let you understand better what I have done, I want to explain you a couple of very interesting cases of study I have examined in the book. <coughs> the Norwegian Archer's Brassard. As first example, I want to show you the experimental research made on the so-called Norwegian Brassard. As for Bell Beaker's Brassard, the archaeologists have presumed that the arm protection used by the Norwegian Archer's were useful for protecting the inside part of the bow's arm from the heat of the strain during the release. These are all examples of presumed uh, neuralgic brassards. But there is a problem in the whole idea. The neuralgic brassard doesn't protect the inside part of the arm, and usually is too much long, protecting even the outside of the elbow, and then also it protects the outside part of the hand and the fingers, a detail that is very particular. There is another problem. The neurologic archers use it to carry on the back uh, the so called group of areta or quiver group, uh, a carrying system that included uh, a quiver uh, with uh, arrows, sword, and some little containers of unknown function. This means that the neurologic archers was armed and he used a sword for defending himself once the arrows were finished or an armed opponent was getting too close. Probably during the fight, the neurologic archer extracted the sword from his back with the right hand, uh, the same user for, manipula uh, for manipulating the arrows to shoot. But the problem is that usually the neurologic swordmen are represented with a particular protection on the sword arm. We are talking about the, um, the warriors with the shield and the sword. This protection typically is half of the length of uh, the length of the arm, but sometimes it is long enough to protect even the elbow. Uh, and in all examples, in all that examples, it protects the outside part of the hand and the fingers, likely the brassard of the neurologics, exactly like the so-called brassard. The hypothesis proposed are that the archer shifted the asset of his body with the sword arm forward. But in this way, the sword arm will be unprotected. The second idea is that the archer extract the sword, throw away the bow, and fought with just the left arm. That is pretty difficult for many reasons. The other idea, and this is my theory, the archer fought using the presumed brassard as a sort of shield, combined with the bow for parrying the oncoming sword blows of the enemy. The right hand, used for handling the sword, kept, it was kept backwards and is potentially safe, used just in the proper moment for striking with a thrust or a cut. The neurologic brass starts in the end looks more likely a protection for the oncoming sword speeds than from protecting the inside part of the arm by the bowstring or from another archer's arrow. In fact, the most protected archers uh, depicted in the neurologic iconography don't have this brassard. Uh, also, it is interesting to notice that they don't have any sword on the back. Um, another interesting case that I want to talk to you is uh, the one of the boxers of Monte Prano. As I said previously, the neurologic statues show different, war uh, different warriors, shielded sword fighters, archers, and so called boxers like this one. These uh, boxers have been compared to the Greek and Roman boxers of centuries later. The main difference, however, is the fact that uh, this boxer was using shields, or at least this is the opinion of the most part of the scholars. The combatants are naked except for uh, the V-shaped skirt around the waist. 
This is a reconstruction of the shield used by these boxers. The left arm carries a shield, possibly leather, reinforced with thin, long pieces of wood and secured with a handle and a strap. The right arm you know, is wrapped inside a long brace protection with round spike protection for the hand and sometimes a band on the humerus. The glove seems to have, especially in the little bronze statues, some studs. So, the idea is that these fighters fought each other striking the opponent that uses the shield for protecting the body and the head of the damage procured by the star. But trying to reconstruct in, the, in this kind of combat, I have studied ancient boxing and reconstructed the boundary. The idea of scholars on this combat was that the boxers could have done the punches like in a modern way. But as we know from other studies in an armed ancient combat, like Pankration or Pigmachia, uh, they have different strikes, especially the so-called hammer fist, or basically this one. So, trying to make a good reconstruction, I have analyzed uh, the, perfect, the most perfect examples of neuralgic boxing gloves that uh, we have, the ones of the statues of Monte Prano. As you can see, this one is from a little bronze of 8 cm. Uh, and this one is from the statues that are high 2 meters. The detail that we can uh, see is much more appreciable, as we can see. In the bronze, there is like this can be the, the spike glove, and this part is presumed to be like a stud or something. But in the stone statues, they are more precise, so we have uh, this thing that can be a stud. And this part that looks like a guard, and it's very, very strange because it is L shape, as you can see. So, um, obviously, the, um, in this glove, we can observe that the stud is not all over the round part of the glove, so the striking motion will be different, not a jab or another kind, uh, but probably was this one, because the stud is under the pin. So, there are no other strikes out there. So, furthermore, we see a transversal protection for the face located above the stud. Because, because of so, obviously, the gesture of the striking cannot be like in the modern boxing. But the only strikes that can be done must be hammer fist ones. This motion with the arm remember the one used for striking with weapons. In fact, trying to make a reconstruction of this particular globe, and I will show you later, I have realized that the final shape is more similar to a weapon used in a neurologic time. In fact, you can see this is the supposed stud, and this is the, let's, let's call it guard, or hill. So I have tried to do a reconstruction that was very close to the original one, and in the first uh, in the first try was this sort of thing that you can see also there, but it wasn't very effective as that needed some kind of handle inside for trying to to secure the thing to the glove. As you can see, this was the first try, so mm -hmm. trying to be very close to the original, with the first idea of boxing glove, with uh, stars all over, it was put away. I have tried to do uh, okay. something close to this one, to this direction. So I have tried to make in the first reference to the second reconstruction, like in this way. As you can see, if you grab the thing like this, okay, like in this way, you can see that for doing something like this, we, you need to fix it to the glove. So I needed another thing that was probably a handle that would go inside the boxing glove. So I needed uh, something to grab, something to be more secure with the glove itself. But for doing such thing, I needed to make a hole in the glove and was very awkward. Or try to fix it with some kind of glue, but it, it didn't work because at the first strike we will have lost the thing. So I have put away this interpretation and tried something like this. Something more, uh, let's say, more soft. That probably was the same thing, 
we don't know how much rigid was this protection. So in, in my time, let's put away the protection for the arm. And that's another interesting thing. If you have this kind of protection that goes like in, for the brassard of the archers, uh, protects also the, the elbow. And that's also an interesting detail. But let's go to the, to the globe and just point. So, if I have something like this, you can see that it is similar to the representation of the statue, but when I was trying to do a reconstruction, as I do some uh, bronze casting in, uh, in the meantime, this was very close to this one, and this is the so-called Daga, um, El Sagamata knife or dagger, and usually is carried by the chiefs and the warriors of Nuragic society. In, in the statues of, uh, uh, not in the statues of Monte Prama, just on the little bronzes. In all the statues of Monte Prama, there are no uh, El Sagamata knives on it. So, my idea at some point was that uh, what we see in this part was just a broken blade. So, you're basically seeing some kind of armed combat instead of a uh, like boxing combat with shields. And this is explaining why they are using a shield. Because for just protecting from the stud didn't mean nothing. I mean, Roman uh, pigmachia was done with the same studs. They used uh, even a glass on, uh, on, on the glove for procuring more damage to the adversary. So, but uh, the reconstruction and the archaeological findings are very similar. In fact, analyzing the stone statues, the archaeologists have found traces of sculpted wounds carved in the stone, filled with red copper for simulating the human globe. And uh, the, the forensic archaeologists that have studied these uh, marks on the statues suggested that they were blade marks, like they have tried to reproduce it. The archaeologists that have excavated the statues have theorized that the boxers fought against an armed opponent in a kind of ritual combat, but the boxer was not armed because uh, there, there was still the interpretation that this was just a boxer. The necropolis is an alignment of uh, uh, various numbers of graves containing young owls, like the one I showed you before. Oh, uh, these owls were of um, let's say young men of 16, 18 years old, very fit and muscular, accustomed to, with long and extensive trains, with muscular and bone deformation, especially to the left and the right arm. Also, the alimentation of these combatants was very specific, um, and the isotopic analysis showed that they had a very specific diet based on fish and soft food. All the data, seems uh, to push to a necropolis of young elite warriors that possibly fought in a ritual combat armed with shield and, if my theory is correct, with the iconic gamma hilted dagger carried usually by chieftains and warriors of the Nuragic society. To be fair, the osteological analysis on the bones of the necropolis of Monte Prama, in the anthropologists have, have found more blood force traumas than blade cut than, than blade cut marks. And this is definitely an aspect that needs to be explained. In my honest opinion, I think that these warriors can be considered some sort of predecessors of the Etruscan and Roman Gustuari, uh, sort of let's call it gladiators, that used to fight to the death or in a more ritual combat to next to the Bustos. That was the funeral part. We have a similar description also in the Iliad with the fights organized, organized by Achilles for Patroclus' funeral. The final argument that I want to tell you, uh, let's just say, uh, let's just see uh, for a moment in the picture. This is the, the boxing glove from uh, one of the Monte Prama statues, and this is the same dagger I have reconstructed, but uh, I have done the picture, the photography, <coughs> like trying to have the blade, the blade in front of me. So I, I see basically the same kind, kind of guard that I see the hilt that I see in the statue. And that, this is what, why I've tried to do this kind of reconstruction with the dagger. 
And this is an original example of uh, neuralgic uh, uh, gamma hitter factors. These ones instead are the wounds that they, they have observers on the status. As you can see, they are very narrow and looks like some kind of, uh, let's say, stabbing motion or stab uh, trauma. And this is on the chest of the, uh, the presumed boxer or presumed the pre gladiator as you can call it. It's very strange that the, um, the, the fighter had eight of these uh, uh, wounds on the, on the chest because if the blade was long, uh, let's say, 10 centimeters, for killing a person just need one stab. So, in my opinion, and it's something I have moved on recently, the blade was probably more shorter, so they can see the, um, the trauma, like uh, some, uh, in some rural societies they still do that, they try to have uh, shorter weapons, we're just seeing that a, they have made the wound, but they, they don't kill, obviously, the opponent. So, in some, some sort of way, they prove that they are better fighters, but they don't end killing each other. And this is the end for this part. <laughs>